Hello, everyone. Welcome to lesson 30 of Calculus 1. So today is a very important lesson, as you can probably tell by the title here. Today, we're going to talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus, which actually has two different components to it. So before we get to that, I want to explain uh, what we're going to be doing with this fundamental theorem of calculus, which is also called uh, the FTC for short. Uh, so remember that a derivative the way we remember a derivative is it's the instantaneous rate of change of a function. So if you find the derivative of a function, say at x equals 1, that's telling you how quickly the function is increasing or decreasing at x equals 1. So there's our derivative. And then now we've been talking about the definite integral. So I'm going to talk about the integral here. And it turns out that the integral has to do with change as well. The integral represents the total amount of change, and it'll be that amount of change on the interval a to b. So by taking the integral between two points, you're finding out how much did that function change over that interval. And notice that both of these have to do with change. Now, what we're going to do today is we're going to see that the derivative and integral are in a certain sense uh, opposites or inverse relations of one another. So kind of like how plus and minus or adding and subtracting are inverse operations. We have multiplying and dividing. We have natural log and e to the something. Uh, the list goes on and on with opposing operations in mathematics. So what we're going to learn today is that the derivative and the integral are going to be our new set of opposite operations here. All right, so let's get into it here. Uh, let's talk about the FTC, and then this will be part one. Now, people disagree about which part is part one, which part is part two. I'm just going to call this one part one. Part one of the fundamental theorem of calculus says that if we have the integral from a to b of f prime of x dx, then this will end up being f of b minus f of a, provided that this is continuous on the interval a to b. All right, so let's examine what's happening here. So inside our integral, we have a derivative. So we're putting a derivative into the integral. And what do we get out of it? We get the original function itself. So what this is saying is that the integral of a derivative, the way we could figure out what that is, is we use the original function. So an analogy here is if we started with x and we added 5 and then we subtracted 5, we would end up back where we started. We would end up back with x. So we have a function. We take its derivative and then we integrate from a to b. Uh, we don't quite get f of x, but we do get f of b minus f of a, so something with the original function here. So this is the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. Uh, this is going to be by far the one we're going to use the most often because it turns out that we can use this as a technique for integration. So remember in the last video, I had three different ways of doing a definite integral. Um, the first one's very difficult uh, using the limit of a Riemann sum. The second one can only be done in certain situations using geometry. Uh, but this, this is the third way of computing an integral. Um, so to compute an integral, what we're most often going to do is we're going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus and an antiderivative. Because as we see here, all we need to do to do this integral is find out what the antiderivative of this function is, because the antiderivative of f prime will be f. So we've reduced the problem integration to just finding an antiderivative. All right, now this is the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now this isn't a heavy proof-based class, uh, but for something like the fundamental theorem of calculus, I do want to go uh, into a proof of that. So let's go ahead and get started. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with f of b minus f of a, and I'm going to work my way towards getting this integral right here. All right, so we have f of b minus f of a here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this as n differences. So I'm going to break this up into pieces. So I'm going to have f of b, which I'll think of as xn, minus f of x n minus 1. So this is a tiny little step backwards from b. 
All right, well, if I subtracted that, I need to add it back in to balance it. So these will cancel out to be zero because we don't have any of those here. Um, but then what I'm going to do next is I'm going to subtract f of x n minus two. And then in order to balance that out, I have to add an f of x n minus two, but then I'm going to subtract f of x n minus three. And this is gonna keep going on and on and on until I add f of x one and then I subtract f of x zero, but it turns out that f of x zero will be a. So our b is xn and our a is x zero. And notice that this whole giant thing is the same as this because all of these intermediate terms can cancel out right here. So that's why this is the same as this. Okay, now why on earth did we write it this way? Uh, well, before we get into that, let's go ahead and write this in a more compact way. Remember the way to write something with a sum where we have plus uh, the ellipses here, a better way to do that is to use sigma notation. So the sigma notation for this would be i equals one to n of f of x i minus f of x i minus one. So that's what we're doing is effectively we have all of these pairs of differences here. So we have f of x n minus f of x n minus one, f of x n minus one minus f of x n minus two, da, 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 all the way down to the last pair, which will be f of x one minus f of x zero. And so that's the pattern. We have two function values subtracted with the second one having a lower x value. So this is sigma notation for that. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define delta x to be x i minus x i minus one. And I'm gonna assume there's a uniform difference between all of these xi's. So this is the b minus a over n that we have for Riemann sum. So that's gonna be xi minus xi minus one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the top and bottom by that. So I have delta x and delta x is the same as xi minus xi minus one. Okay, so what does that give us if we rewrite it a little bit? We have f of xi minus f of xi minus one, all divided by xi minus xi minus one times delta x, which is the same thing as this. That's why I was able to multiply the top and bottom by seemingly different things because they're actually the same. Now, what is this right here? So we have f of a number minus f of a different number over that number minus the other x value. So it seems like we've seen something like this before, and it turns out that we have. We've seen this in the mean value theorem, or MVT. So what does the mean value theorem say? It says that if we have a difference quotient like this, where we have a change in f over a change in x, over the same x values here, then there's gotta be some c in the interval xi minus one to xi. So it's gotta be in between these two x values where f prime of, I'm gonna call it ci actually, because which what c it is will depend on what i is here. f of ci will be f of xi minus f of xi minus one over xi minus xi minus one, which is exactly what we have right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick that C in every single one of these little intervals here, and I'm going to replace it with F prime of C. So we have F prime of C I, because each C will be different for each interval, and then we have delta X. And then now if you look at this right here, this is actually a Riemann sum for F prime. So this is, we have F prime with an X value inside each of these intervals, and then we multiply that by delta x. So this would be the height of all the little rectangles, and then this would be the width. So what I'm going to do now is I'm gonna go back to the beginning here. Remember, we started off with this, so this is equal to this right here. I'm gonna do the limit as n goes to infinity for both sides. So I'm gonna apply the limit to both sides, and that should be the same because they're equal. Now notice that there isn't any n in here at all. A and B don't have anything to do with n. N only comes into play when we split it up into all these pieces. So this is in an era before n, 
So to sending n to infinity doesn't change this at all. So we're going to have f of b minus f of a for that. However, n does affect this side. If we send the limit as n goes to infinity for a function evaluated at all these little intervals times delta x, that's none other than the definite integral from a to b of that function. And there we go. This is exactly what we wanted to prove. The definite integral of a derivative is the change in the function value. Or you can think of this as the integral represents the total amount of change between a and b. That's what I was saying earlier. So integration is the total amount of change if you integrate f prime right here. All right, so there we go. So we proved the fundamental theorem of calculus. And by the way, we use the fact that f prime was continuous here in the mean value theorem, because that means that we have a derivative existing for all these little intervals here. Okay, so that's the proof of this, uh, but I bet you might be a little more interested in what is this going to do for us? So we did all this big proof. We have this formula now, f of b minus f of a is the integral of f prime, but what does that actually do for us? Well, remember in a previous video, we spent quite a bit of time finding the limit of the Riemann sum uh, to find the area under this curve. So remember, that's another way to interpret definite integrals is the area under the curve. And we ended up doing the definite integral 0 to 3 of 2x squared plus 1. Now, earlier in that video, I think it took about 20 minutes to go through the limit of the Riemann sum. It definitely took quite a bit. Um, but now we're going to be able to do this instantly. So what we do is we imagine this 2x squared plus 1 here like our f prime of x. And all we need to do is find what f is, and then we plug in 3 and subtract when we plug in zero and we're good to go. All right, well, if f prime of x is 2x squared plus one, this means that f of x will be 2x cubed over three plus x. And so what we do before we plug in the numbers here, we draw what's called the evaluation line and then we put the numbers we're going to plug in here. So this is f of x and it's going to be evaluated from zero to three, AKA we're going to do this. So doing the antiderivative of this was relatively simple. And then we just go ahead and plug in the numbers. So we have two times three cubed, but then we're gonna divide by three. So that's two times three squared or 18. And then I have plus three and then I subtract. So that was F of three right here. And I subtract when I plug zero into here, but zero into both of these will simply be zero. So we end up with 21. So we did in um, what previously took about 15, 20 minutes, we did that in about one minute using our fundamental theorem of calculus right here. So this is the primary use of the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. It helps us compute integrals because it turns them into antiderivatives here. All right, let's do a few more examples of this and then I'll get on to what the other side of the fundamental theorem of calculus is. So what I wanna do now is I wanna find the area under the curve of f of x equals sine of x plus cosine of x on the interval zero to pi over two. All right, let's go ahead and figure that out. So the area under a curve is going, or at least the signed area under a curve will be the integral of this right here, the definite integral. So we have zero to pi over two of sine of x plus cosine of x. And signed area and area for this problem are exactly the same. There's no difference between them because this function is gonna be positive on the interval zero to pi over two. And I know that because both sine and cosine are individually positive from zero to pi over two. So I don't need to worry about whether this says signed or not for this problem. All right, so I'm going to do exactly the same thing I did for my previous problem here. I'm going to find the antiderivative of the integrand or the thing plugged inside the integral. The antiderivative of sine will be negative cosine of x. And the antiderivative of cosine will be sine of x. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in pi over two into here and then subtract when I plug zero into here. 
That's what this little line with the numbers in it means. All right, I'm going to go ahead and plug pi over 2 into here. So we have negative cosine of pi halves plus sine of pi halves. And then we subtract and then we plug in zero into here. So we have negative cosine of zero plus sine of zero. All right, so let's see what this is. Uh, cosine of zero, or sorry, cosine of pi over two, excuse me, is zero. Sine of pi over two is one. So we have one for this part. And then here, cosine of zero is, is one, but then we have a negative. So this is negative one and sine of zero is zero. We have one minus negative one, which ends up giving us two here. Now I want to point out this example specifically. Uh, one habit that's really easy to get into is that for many functions, particularly polynomials, if you have zero as a bottom bound, it'll often get zero inside this function right here for the second evaluation. So it's really tempting in the future to be like, oh, there's a zero there, I'm just going to ignore this. But this is an example showing where even though we plugged in zero into here, we still ended up getting something that wasn't zero. So I just wanted to make sure we address that. Okay, now those of you who may remember the antiderivative section may remember that there's actually more than one antiderivative for each function. That's why we included the plus C in all of them because uh, we could have any constant here. So for example, another antiderivative of sine of X plus cosine of X would be negative cosine plus sine, uh, maybe plus one for example. So why do I keep picking the antiderivative without the constant here? Wouldn't the constant perhaps make a difference in this calculation? And the answer turns out to be no. Let's go ahead and do the same problem again, only this time I'm going to use the general antiderivative. So I have negative cosine of x plus sine of x, and then I add any constant I want here. I'm going to evaluate this from 0 to pi over 2. OK, well, I plug pi over 2 into here. I mean, that's the same as what we got for this part, only I'm going to have a plus c. So I have 1 plus c here. And then I subtract. And then I plug 0 in for this, which will give me this, and then an additional c. So I have negative 1 plus c. But what happens here? is I have C, and then if I distribute this negative, I have 1 plus C plus 1 minus C. So no matter what that constant is, it will cancel out. And we'll actually get the same answer as what we got earlier. Now, this isn't a fluke of this particular function or anything like that. This will always happen for any antiderivative that we find. So you might as well just forget about the plus C when we have a definite integral, because it's not going to make any difference in your answer. All right, I want to go over one more example like this, and then we'll move on to the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. All right, I want to do the integral of negative one to two of one over x squared dx. Okay, now this one's going to have a kind of a strange pitfall, but let's talk about that in a little bit later. Um, I'm going to find the antiderivative of one over x squared, kind of like we did for these other ones. This is x to the negative two. So if I raise the power by one, I have x to the negative one, and then I divide by negative one. So overall, I'm going to get negative one over x from negative one to two. All right, so when I plug in my function values here, I have negative one half, and then I'm going to subtract negative one over negative one. Um, another comment here is that there are often a lot of negative signs with these evaluations because we're always subtracting the second one. You may have a function in your negative, or sorry, excuse me, you may have a negative in your function and you may also have a negative number you're plugging in. So this is an instance where we have three negative signs. So we end up with negative three halves as an answer for the signed area here. But if we look at this function, something seems kind of fishy about that. One thing about 1 over x squared is 1 over x squared is always greater than 0, no matter what x we plug in there. So the graph of this function is always going to be above the x-axis, yet somehow the signed area ends up being negative 3 halves. So how does that work? And it turns out that that's actually not the correct answer. So it turns out that this work right here isn't really correct. 
is the graph of one over x squared will look something like this. And the area from negative one to two will be something like that. So it's all above the x axis, so it should be some positive number, not negative. So what went wrong here? Well, remember, one of our assumptions for the fundamental theorem of calculus was whatever is in here needs to be continuous. But the fact of the matter is, is that this is not continuous at x equals zero, which is inside this interval. So that will end up giving you crazy answers like this when we don't have some, when we have a discontinuity in there, especially a, a vertical asymptote like this. Now, how do we deal with that? Well, that's actually something we're going to need to say for calculus too. Um, but for now, just be careful to make sure that whatever you're integrating is continuous or else something like this may happen. All right, now let's move on to the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. So the part one version told us what happened when we did the integral of a derivative. So the FTC part two will give us what happens if we do the derivative of an integral. All right, well, how is this going to work? Well, let's suppose that we want to compute the derivative of the integral from some number to x of f of t dt. So here you can see we have the derivative of an integral right here. Now the variable in question is actually right here. So our variable is actually one of the bounds. So since we have a variable in the bounds, we can't use that same variable for the integration here. So we use another variable or a dummy variable called t right here. We can't also have x be here. Okay, so if I do this derivative, then what happens? Well, the derivative and the integral, they cancel out, so to speak. And we end up with the original function that's on the inside here. So the derivative of an integral ends up just giving you the function itself. Okay, now why is this true? Well, let's go ahead and take a look at a proof of this. So whenever we encounter a new type of function, this is certainly a new type of function here, the integral from a to x of something, when we need to know the derivative of that, it's best to go back to the limit definition of the derivative because we haven't differentiated anything that looks like this before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to call this function, this whole thing, g of x, because x is my variable here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the limit definition of the derivative for g, and I want to show that g prime ends up being f of x. So once I'm done with this derivative, I should end up with f of x as the end result. Okay, well, let's see. The derivative of g is the limit as h goes to 0 of g of x plus h minus g of x divided by h. Okay, well, let's see what we have for that. So if this is g of x, the g of x plus h is the same thing, only we have an x plus h up here. So this is g of x plus h, and then I subtract g of x, so that's just the original. And then I divide by h. All right, so all I did was I substituted in what my um, function is here. Now let's take a careful look at this. So this is asking, this is telling us the signed area under the curve from a to x plus h. And what we're doing is we're taking away from this the signed area from a to x, when x is a little bit further to the left than x plus h right here. So what does this look like geometrically? Well, let's say here's our function. Here's a, here's x, and then maybe x plus h is a little bit further. So the first integral is all of this area right here. But then the second integral, we're taking away this area. So what are we left with? We're left with this tiny little strip of area right here. So it turns out that the top can simplify to be the integral of x to x plus h of f of t dt. All right, now one condition I forgot to specify here is that f of x needs to be continuous. So we need to make sure, oops, I didn't pull that down enough. 
we need to make sure that our f is continuous because what we're about to do next relies on it being continuous. Okay, now you may recall from the previous lesson the fact where if I have f sandwiched in between two values over a certain region, then um, let's just do on the interval a to b, then I know that little m times b minus a is less than or equal to the integral from a to b of this function, and that's less than or equal to big M times B minus A. So this is a fact that we saw last time. So if I take the minimum and I integrate it, I'm definitely gonna get something less than if I integrated the function itself. And if I took the maximum and integrated, it would definitely be bigger than the integral itself. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to apply this inequality to this right here. So what this gives me is it gives me that M and then now my b and my a, this is my b and this is my a. So I have x plus h minus x over h is less than or equal to the limit as h goes to zero of what I had previously, what I'm trying to figure out here. And then this is less than or equal to this, m x plus h minus x over h right here. All right, so effectively what I did was I replaced this with this inequality right here. So that's why we have all these H's on the bottoms and all of the limits, because I was just replacing this with one of these two, and that forms this inequality here. Okay, now let's take a look at what's happening. I have X plus H minus X. Well, the X's will cancel both here and here. So then I just have H over H, and those will cancel as well. So what I end up with is simply little m right here, or rather the limit as h goes to zero little m, and the limit as h goes to zero big M. Okay, and because these are continuous, so f is continuous over this interval, th these little m's and big m's are guaranteed to exist. Now remember, this is the minimum value of f, and this is the maximum value of f right here. Now let's think about our function. Let's go back up to this picture here. So as our interval gets smaller, as our h goes to zero, I can maybe draw the minimum here and the maximum here. And they're a little bit different. Uh, big M is up here, little m is right here. But as h gets smaller and smaller, there's uh, fewer, less and less variety of our function. So there's fewer places. Um, let me, let me say that a little bit better. As h goes to zero, our min and our max get, max get pushed together here. And as h heads to zero, these will actually be the same thing because we lose pretty much all of our interval, uh, except for this x right here. We'll never lose what x is, but we'll lose anything past x because this h is going to zero. So what is this saying? As the limit as h goes to zero of little m, is f of x, and that's also the limit as h goes to zero of big M. So as our interval shrinks and shrinks, our min and our max get closer together until we take the limit, and then they're the same thing. All right, now what does this tell us? This tells us that the limit as h goes to zero of our integral here is sandwiched in between two of the same thing. So effectively, we use the squeeze theorem here. Now, if you have something that's less than or equal to a value, but then also, or sorry, greater than or equal to a value and also less than or equal to a value, they must be equal. But what is this thing in the middle? Remember, this thing in the middle was g prime of x. So we see that this must equal f of x, which is what we were trying to prove to begin with. So the derivative of g ends up being f. So again, usually I don't resort to proofs in this class because this isn't a, um, you know, analysis course, a proof-based class. But I um, I wanted to show this because it is the fundamental theorem of calculus. So I figured if we were going to prove anything, it would be this. So what this says is that the derivative of an integral or the rate of change of an area function is the function itself. All right, let's do a few examples with this, and then we'll call it a day here. All right, so for example. Let's say we wanted to find the derivative of the function 
0 to x of t squared plus t plus 1 dt. Well, remember, the variable down here needs to have a different name than this variable here. All right, well, this is literally the fundamental theorem of calculus part two verbatim. If we have the derivative of an integral, and it actually doesn't matter what number this is at all. Um, if we have the derivative of an integral here or this area function, we simply plug x into the function. We don't need to do any derivatives or antiderivatives. We simply get whatever's inside here. And that's it, that's all we need to do for this. Okay, let's take a look at another example here. Let's say that we spice things up a bit. So let's say instead of just having an x up here, let's say I want to get creative and plug in, say, an x squared. And then I have some function in here, like, say, cosine of t. Now, let's go back to what we called these earlier. So earlier, we called the integral from a number to x, we called that g of x, right? So what would this be? this would actually be g of x squared, because rather than just plugging in an x up here, we're plugging in an x squared instead. So we could think of this as g of x squared. So if we do the derivative of g of x squared, by the chain rule, we have g prime of x squared times 2x. Now what we just proved here is that g prime is the function inside here. So if we want to translate this back to what we have here, g prime is the function inside or cosine. But instead of just an x plugged in, I have x squared. So I have cosine of x squared right there. And then I have this extra 2x tacked on because of the chain rule. All right, so this one was a little bit trickier, but we can handle things that don't have just an x in there as well if we use the chain rule. All right, one final example here. Let's say we want to do the same problem again, only we want to integrate from sine of x to cosine of x of e to the, oops, I always make that mistake, e to the t dt right here. All right, so how are we supposed to do this one? So all of these other ones had a, a constant value here in the denominator, or sorry, in the lower bound, but this has two functions in both bounds. Well, first, what we're going to do is we're going to split up this integral. So I'm going to split up this integral to be the integral from 0 to cosine. And then I have sine to 0. So what I did was I kind of cut this in half. And I made our bottom bound go up to 0 and then stop. And then we resume from that 0 and go to cosine of x. So remember from our properties of integration that these are the same right here. Next, what I'm going to do is I noticed that the fundamental theorem of calculus part two requires my function part of the bound to be in as the upper bound. So I'm going to change the order of integration by gaining a negative sign here. And then now I have a situation that's similar to my previous example here. I could use the chain rule to get the derivative of these integrals. So I'm going to, you do the derivative of an integral. I plug in whatever the bound is, and then I multiply by the derivative of the bound. So I'm effectively doing g prime of cosine of x times the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine. And then I do the same over here. I have e to the sine of x, and then I multiply by the derivative of sine which will end up being cosine right here. So there we go, we have our derivative. So it is possible to handle the derivative of integrals that have um, an upper and lower bound, both being of a variable. All right, well, that's it for this lesson. So this is definitely a big, important lesson. Uh, most importantly, we learned the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, which helps us evaluate integrals. So that's very useful. So what we're going to do next time is we're going to explore a little bit deeper how the integral measures the total amount of change. We're going to look at some particular applied examples of that. So I'll see you guys in that video.